Okay, so here we are, um, fourth day of rehearsals for Blue Boy. Um, third day of rehearsals for Blue Boy, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Um, can you introduce yourselves first, please? Uh, I'm Margaret Wilkinson, and I'm the writer. And I'm Tess Denman and I'm the director. Hi. Um, well, I mean, very straightforwardly, first of all, Margaret, perhaps you could just talk a little bit about where the inspiration for Blue Boy came from. Um, yeah, well, the inspiration uh, came from a number of places, as probably it always does. Uh, it came from um, an interest in some uh, current issues at the time, which was uh, some of the fallout from some high-profile uh, cases involving children in care, um, particularly Baby P and what happened with uh, the social workers uh, who were involved and particularly uh, Sharon Shoesmith, who was, what was she, the head of um, the Gay service? Social yeah. Services, was it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it was me addressing an issue, but also because I'm the kind of writer I am, I was also interested in throwing something um, unexpected and supernatural, otherworldly, at the um, uh, at this issue, uh, so that it's not a naturalistic play. It's very heightened, and I've been calling it office gothic or office noir. Um, so I was also influenced, as I often am by ghost stories and particularly Henry James' Turn of the Screw, which is a really simple ghost story uh, that can be read as something supernatural or something psychological. Okay, so, thank you. I think also that um, by expanding the, sort of the styles that are incorporated in the play, so it's not just a naturalistic play about what we think is wrong with care services, it makes it a, more, a play which is more reflective and more um, philosophical in a way um, and opens it out to how do we deal with issues of responsibility or culpability in society in other areas of our lives um, mm -hmm. and not just um, a naturalistic play about the care service and how and what we might think is wrong with it that that would be quite limiting and so those different styles that are incorporated in the play sort of open it out as a question for the audience. Okay. So that it has an emotional truth about it, rather than just a literal truth, um, in the way myths do. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it operates almost on a mythic level, mm -hmm. dare I say. <laughs> you dare. Um, you, it, it's set in an office, it's a two-hander set, set in an office, which very straightforwardly, but perhaps you could talk about the theatrical, how, you, how theatrically you're going to create this supernatural world, this distorted world, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the creative team that you put together and the sorts of things you, you're, you're thinking about at this point. Okay. I'll just start, but Tess <laughs> probably has more to say about that. One of the things I thought was very important, actually we thought, we, we discussed, is that it begins quite naturalistically and as the play progresses it heightens and distorts, so that in the beginning it is important that as an audience we're encouraged to identify with these characters and to think um, they are like people we know or we are like them in some way and that as they change and distort and turn um, uh, very surprising um, it, it feels more pa that, that has a, a lot of power I think. So that we start from a familiar environment where we can um, uh, connect with the characters and understand that the situation that they're in and how we, we might respond if we were in their situation. And then the play moves into something more heightened or stylized um, in order to ask the questions that it's asking about um, responsibility or guilt. Um, but that was a really good starting point for getting together the creative team, this idea that we start from normality and then we move to somewhere slightly more paranormal or unexpected um, or un real. Um, so we got together uh, Verity Quinn, who's the designer, um, who's designed a set which um, I won't give away, but uh, the idea was that it could dissolve or it could appear very solid, um, but
but then the properties of it began to be in question and how uh, familiar that environment might actually be or how certain we could be of those foundations which seem at first solid and normal, um, how reliable they are. Um, and then uh, Jeremy Bradfield and Douglas Kurt, who are the sound designer and lighting designer, um, who again are working alongside us to, to create um, an environment which is sort of warps as we move through the play and becomes more distorted from this familiar, normal, solid place that we start from. Um, so Jeremy in particular has been working with the sounds that you would expect in an office building, um, filing cabinets or footsteps or air conditioning and um, how we can start from that place of very, somewhere very familiar and turn it into something which is much more unnerving or unsettling or um, we start to question how sure we are of our surroundings. Right. I think it's very thrilling when ordinary everyday uh, sights and sounds become, become sinister and menacing. So Which is then, so it was a really, it was a really great um, place to start and it's something that is really at the centre of Margaret's writing, this idea of somewhere which is very everyday but then become, is called into question, um, was a really great brief then for the rest of the creative team, um, somewhere which is physically solid but turns into something else. How will I as an audience member feel when I'm watching this Terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's also fun, it is moments of... Um, yeah, the brief to Jeremy actually was terrify the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, Grip them and don't let them go. I suppose um, we would like uh, the audience to consider how they would behave in this situation. Um, moments when they have felt guilty or responsible um, for an incident uh, and how you cope with that sense of guilt and how in these cases such as Shannon Sh uh, Shoesmith or um, other high profile cases of um, sort of scapegoating people or choosing one individual who can be responsible for this um, tragedy, uh, how correct that is mm -hmm. and how we as society desire the satisfaction of those answers that seem black and white, it was your fault and so we can answer that by punishing you or sacking you. Um, but actually the situation is much more complex than that and that doesn't solve the problem and it might be a much more systematic or cultural failing um, which is much more difficult to address. Um, so rather than it being uh, limited to um, high profile cases of tragedies in the care system, um, that the audience then question how, how they deal with guilt or responsibility or culpability and how we can do that in the healthiest, most youth, useful way. Um, but also I think it is, um, it's also just a really great story <laughs> and hopefully it's kind of quite exciting and all of that, um, how certain we are and what's happening and what's gonna happen next and sort of quest um, questions about the identity of this boy who's arriving in the night that hopefully is quite thrilling. Um, yeah, alongside that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>